Hi, I'm Ulysses, and this is Music, Meaning, and Mystery, a podcast for the other musicians. My guest for this episode is Joshua Cutchen. Joshua is a musician, more specifically, a tubist. Joshua is also an author. He's written seven critically acclaimed books, including A Trojan Feast, The Food and Drink Offerings of Aliens, Fairies, and Sasquatch. He's co-authored Where the Footprints End, essentially the Bible of Bigfoot, in two volumes. His latest book is also a two-volume masterwork called Ecology of Souls, A New Mythology of Death and the Paranormal. Our conversation does take us to where music overlaps the sorts of phenomena that Joshua Cutchen has deeply researched. You can find more information about Joshua at joshuacutchen.com. The links will be in the show notes. Now for our conversation. How old were you when you started playing tuba? So this is really interesting to me because like when I do podcasts, it's always about the books and stuff and I never get a chance to sort of talk about this stuff. Um, I was in sixth grade. So, well, seventh grade, actually. So how old are you in seventh grade? Four, five, six, probably 12, 11. It was completely a byproduct of the needs of the band program. I had originally thought about playing trombone, which trombone players are historically better employed than tuba players. So it's a bad choice, I guess. But uh, the band director just needed warm bodies to play tuba. Um, But I really did seem to take to it like a fish to water. Um, I was uh, the first seventh grader in our district band to ever make district band. It was primarily um, comprised of, uh, of eighth graders, but I was the first kid from the county to do that. And, uh, you know, continued with a lot of these honor bands, um, more often than not sitting first chair, and it became an absolute obsession for me. And, you know, sort of going back and forth about whether or not I was going to go into music when I went to, when I went to college. And uh, for whatever reason, I got pushed over the threshold, and I ended up uh, going to the University of Wisconsin in Madison to uh, get a degree in music performance. So at 12 years old, the... You must not have been very much bigger than the instrument itself. Well, you know, my mom actually uh, found some old height and weight records um, for me. And I think that I was pushing six feet around that age, actually. So I was, I was yeah, so I was pretty well, um, I was pretty well built for it. And, you know, there are, there are different sizes of tubas. You know, we're used to seeing the sousaphone, which is the one that you wear. Um, but, you know, they have everything from these gigantic monstrosities to to quite uh manageable little horns um so that really wasn't too much of an issue and you know it's it's, it's interesting because you compare that starting age to starting ages on other instruments and it's it's really different with brass instruments because there are physiological restrictions to really when you can begin that right you know if you you can you can start kids on a brass instrument at an earlier age but you know, pedagogically speaking, it's probably around that sixth grade, seventh grade uh, window when it is best to start kids because, you know, their face muscles <laughs> aren't really going to develop too much more um, than they would normally. Whereas, you you know, you have these Suzuki kids learning violin who are learning from, you know, age two or whatever. So, so there's, so as you know, as a, as a wind player in general, but a brass player more specifically, there's always, a, you will feel like a, a lot of catching up to do with the kids who've been playing piano since they could walk, you know? I know that through your podcast appearances, you've uh, mentioned in passing that there are specific times of the year where the the tubist, is it a tubist? <laughs> it is a tubist, actually, yeah. Okay, where the tubist is in... Uh, you know, especially high demand. So if I'm assuming uh, around the time of Mardi Gras. Yep. And then I think you mentioned like, I think two times of the year or three times of the year. Yeah, generally speaking, it's it's two times of the year that I'm busiest and I'm just doing multiple gigs every weekend, multiple gigs every day. And those are uh, Mardi Gras and Oktoberfest. You know, it's it's not uncommon to have eight to 10 gigs 
in a Mardi Gras season um, all on weekends. <laughs> so it's just, you know, it's just very densely packed. And then, of course, at Oktoberfest, you know, people want polka bands and stuff like that. So it's, it's the same thing again. And, you know, that's something that tuba players have been trying to get away from for a while is this, you know, almost sort of uh, association that if the tuba's playing, it has to be, you know, somehow ethnic. And I mean that very broadly, but like it has to be like some sort of specific folk music style. And, you know, a lot of us are like, no, not not really. It doesn't have to be that way. Um you know, so through the year, you sort of have to make your own opportunities and sort of have to dispel a lot of these different myths. And I, I've been very fortunate enough to partner with some open-minded people who, uh, you know, both here in town and this band that I used to play with out of Nashville, um, sometimes they would have their bass player not be able to make a gig and they'd say, Josh, do you want to play it? And I don't double on bass. You know, there are a lot of tuba players who do, but I, my left hand is just stupid. I can't get my left hand to do anything. So I just play tuba and, you know, I, I'm like, yeah. So I just hop right in and I try to sound as much like a bass as I can. Um, and those, those are always really, um, they're really an honor to, to sit in with that sort of thing. You know, at one point in my career, the, the best sort of compliments I would get when I was on that classical path was like, I really like the way you match the length of the staccatos with the trumpet section in measure 42 or something like that. And nowadays it's like, no, we won't, you know, our bass player is missing. We sit, we sit in like, that's the biggest compliment that I can get because it also feels like, you know, you're dispelling some of the stereotypes around the instrument, which, you know, again, are that they have to be tied to some sort of almost kitschy uh, genre, but also that, uh, it's not a nimble instrument and in the right hands it can be extremely flexible and nimble mm -hmm. that strikes me as a natural transition uh, as a like into the rhythm section of a rock or pop uh, band because the tuba does strike me as a rhythmic instrument like this uh, like kind of a rhythm section thing so uh, yeah that sounds like it makes sense to me yeah and you know a lot of the a lot of the traditions that i've i've come out of have sort of made it a point to chase after some of the some of the bass stylings um so you know trying to do something that's a little bit slappier um something that's you know got that same pop and that same you know something you, whenever you listen to bass players they use a lot of different octaves um which is not normally something that it's always the easiest to do on a brass instrument, but like a lot of the, that New Orleans brass band tradition that I follow and some of the other folks who do, who are doing strange things on tuba um, are really sort of always chasing after that with the added benefit of, you know, it's an instrument that can actually um, sustain and do some extended effects that you, you, you don't get on, on bass guitar. Of course there's stuff bass guitars can do that we can't, but you know, there's, we're always trying to strike that balance between, you know, how far can I push this that it doesn't sound like a tuba <laughs> while it's still, while it's still being different, you know? Yeah. Um, well, now yeah. we have technology, you could uh, run your tuba through effects, effects chains and really come up with something you know, kind of out of this world if you wanted to. Yeah. There, there are, there are a bunch of guys who, uh, when I say a bunch, I mean, I think about, I can think of about 10 off the top of my head who have, you know, a full set of pedals and they're running it through, um, you know, they're, they're, they're running their, their tuba through all these different effects and it sounds very untuba like. And, you know, I, I have been in the past um, kind of critical of that because it's like, well, you know, if at some point just pick up a different instrument and play that if you're going to make it sound completely not like a tuba. But, you know, I've sort of mellowed on that a, a bit because you know i think it's just important to be as as flexible as you can i haven't really done that you know the most the fanciest that i get is i have a uh you know i have a cabinet that i uh, have i have a, F a fender rumble cabinet because it's lighter and louder than my ampeg even though i like that uh the, the sound of that and uh the, the the fanciest i'll get is there's an overdrive button on that sometimes i'll push that if i want a little bit of extra grit in the sound but uh you know it's it's also hard too because you know, when you're doing all those pedals, when you're playing something like, you know, an electric guitar or bass, like that's the sound that you get. And when you do that with tuba, you're already producing, you know, an acoustic sound. So it's like, well, you know, a, a very audible acoustic sound. Um, so it's like trying to find a balance between like cranking that up to cover your acoustic sound while not getting too loud. Cause you know, that, fin that Fender rumble will chase people out of the room i feel like i'm bringing a bazooka to a knife fight sometimes it's like ah, i don't know if i should be doing this um but yeah and then there are a lot of possibilities and there are even some you know 
some acoustic possibilities that you can do. Um, if you're familiar with uh, Young Blood Brass Band out of out of Madison, Wisconsin, just by sheer coincidence, where I ended up going to college, um, they're one of the more popular uh, in you know I would say in terms of their composition, uh, more um, thoroughly arranged brass bands in terms of the music that they play and their uh long time uh creative force is nat mcintosh who studied with the same uh, teacher that i studied with in madison and he sort of pioneered this he was really influenced by hip-hop and and djs and he pioneered a lot of uh extended effects on the tuba that end up sort of sounding like record scratches and you know dj slips and you get multiphonics in there where you sing while you're playing and, and there's actually a variety of of really strange and kind of quirky kind of gimmicky sounds that you can make on the tuba as well so uh you know but it's also like salt like salt makes food taste better but you don't want to just pile on too much salt <laughs> or it's going to ruin the food so you've got to use that stuff sort of sparingly uh -huh. yeah i'm familiar with the limitations of running an acoustic instrument through an effects chain uh before i switched primarily to singing i was uh, I got went pretty deep into a journey of running an acoustic guitar through an effects chain, and that's the same thing. It has, it's obviously not as loud as the tuba, but you're dealing with uh, it having a resonance chamber, so feedback and managing that and using it, and it having its own sound that you can hear under the uh, the effects. So yeah, it's a uh, it was an interesting challenge, but it, you know, you ha it reaches an end point, like you say, and you got to kind of figure out what it is that, how to come back from that, I guess. Yeah, you know, I'm not sure if I've, if I've succeeded in figuring that out um, <laughs> on my end. And, you know, it's one of those things where I would always like to be playing more than I do, um, which does, isn't to say that I don't play, you know, a good amount, but it's, it's, you know, there are certain limitations that you have. To the number of gigs that you get asked to do because at the end of the day if you just play tuba you just play tuba <laughs> that's such a specific sound for a lot of people so you know i i have i have gotten to the point where here in atlanta i feel pretty comfortable saying that i'm the first call if you want to do some sort of jazz or commercial style um which you know that's through a combination of hard work and just attrition uh, of folks leaving the area or or quitting playing or whatnot yeah, I'm always looking for for new opportunities, and you know, sometimes I feel like a shark where I'm always looking for new stuff. But if you don't have the opportunities to 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 play as much, um, for me, like you know, I can woodshed and experiment all day in the practice room. But I, I feel like I learn the most and I stay the best in shape when I'm actively gigging. Is that how uh, you feel that a musician has to be in order to have a money making <laughs> career in music? Uh, be like a shark well you know there, there I, some of my um some of some of the less work that i'm receiving right now in in that area of my life is a is a deliberate choice um you know i don't know a single well, sorry that's not true i know very few brass players who don't make a significant amount of their income teaching and, you know, I was, had a nice little studio lined up here in Atlanta before my sons were born. Um, but, you know, I was basically leaving the house and teaching lessons all day and coming back and twin toddlers need, <laughs> need attention. So it didn't really make a lot of sense for me to just be like a middleman between, in other words, in other words, if you're paying for childcare because you're out working and you're basically sort of breaking even between childcare and and your work then why are you even you know just stay at home with the kids right so there was a little bit of that that was a deliberate choice um and you know once you get set up with a studio i mean you can just teach and not gig uh you know if you get hooked in with a, some some very active music programs in some of these schools down here um you know i know a i know a guy who had like a a studio of like 30 kids and that, that's a that's a decent living right there um you're teaching all the time and you have to sort of have a high threshold for you know middle school shenanigans and whatnot but uh but yeah so so there's part of that um i feel like as a brass player especially as one of the underrepresented brass instruments which i would sort of lump into that uh french horn tuba and, and euphonium like 
euphoniums are sort of the the black sheep of the brass family like nobody ever wants to call a euphonium player for anything um love them though i do and some of the best musicians i know are euphonium players but it's just not something that people even know what that word means right baritone horn in case anybody's wondering um but yeah those those sort of underrepresented instruments that don't wind up in a horn section for a band or something i think you do have to sort of be a self-starter and look for your own opportunities and try to diversify as as best you can but you know i i think it's it's a good thing and a bad thing like it helps you think outside the box but it also is kind of frustrating because you say to yourself man if i just played anything else as well as i play this i wouldn't stop working you know i've been thinking a lot about money and music and money in general and that's a tough nut to crack there does strike me as some sort of alienation between the two uh, for some reason i've been thinking about and i've gone back to like myth and you know our religious lore to try to figure out a little bit about what music means and uh, you know there's orpheus and the, the psalms and uh, but one in particular regarding money is the story of the Pied Piper. That story has helped me understand, created a model for the moment we're in now in the timeline as musicians. Because the Piper uh, solves a very real problem for a town, which is the plague of rats. And in exchange for a bag of gold. So the price is not set by the musician the, and the price is not set on the music. The price is set on the solving of the problem and payment is refused because <laughs> all he had done was just played a song. Yeah. It was too easy for you to solve that problem. So we're not going to pay you. And there was like a, a real dire price to pay, which was uh, all the children were he absconded with all the children so the loss of an entire generation and i kind of feel that it describes our moment that there's some sort of lack of understanding of what what music means and its utility in our communities that's that's really insightful and you know i guess the punchline would be how much was that bag of gold worth 100 bucks right because every gig that you come across is like you know the corporate gigs are are obviously pay a lot better but anytime you're playing in a, in a bar or festival um you know unless you're headlining it's like 100 bucks and it's been that way since like at least the 80s just 100 bucks but yeah i think that's that is really uh insightful the, the lack of of worth that's placed on it and i don't think people fully grasp how um much work goes into this and i think it's a function of a couple of different things um you know we look like we, we're having so much fun because we are but that doesn't mean we're not working our tails off i think a lot of the music that people consume broadly speaking is simple and yeah you probably could learn how to play it in a month you know because it's so simple if you don't know music you know so so they see that sort of lack of um technical prowess and uh and they sort of just assume that it's super easy and you know that lack of technical prowess can be charming with something like punk but you know a lot of people are just listening to some of this uh some of this pop garbage that is you know more a function of the talent of the producers than it is a talent of any of the you know musicians on display um but yeah there's a there's a real cognitive dissonance um that i've noticed especially since 2020 um where you know, musicians are like the least essential of the essential jobs, right? <laughs> and, you know, I, 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 I sympathize with that a little bit because, you know, I don't have to play tuba to survive, but I do need a loaf of bread and, you know, <laughs> and, and heat and, and shelter. But at the same time, like, what did everybody do during the pandemic? They stayed inside and they just consumed art. And uh, this idea that, you know, art is something that doesn't need to be rewarded. It's like, well, no, you're, 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 you're consuming it. Like, it's, you might have your basic needs covered, but if you don't have art, like what are you doing with your, with your free time? So, yeah, I think it's something that, that has to come to, we have to all have to come to grips with. Um, you know, there was a time when I was a little bit more optimistic about the climate around these things sort of progressing uh, in terms of rewarding musicians more and some of these, you know, foolish ideas about, you know, play at our bar for exposure, those sort of ideas. I thought that they were going away, but I feel like they've just come right back. It's like a bad infection and we didn't, 
it's like a bad infection in the pandemic i thought might be the antibiotic for it but uh i don't think it is i think it's come back and people are just as uh flipping about it as they once were so i think it has to start with musicians that's sort of the project that i'm on here uh we have to understand what it is that we're offering uh in more depth um, and that's why I'm trying to have these conversations and doing this research. We have to understand that what we do is more than entertainment, uh, that more than distraction. Um, why wouldn't the production of joy be something that's worth a lot of money? Why wouldn't the healing that we can offer through music be something that's worth paying for? I think we have to try to come up with some better answers for those sorts of questions. Yeah, I think, you know, I, th I know some people would point to <clears throat> stronger unionization as being uh, a mechanism for that. I'm not so sure how applicable that is to a field where you have a lot of people who are, you know, for lack of a better term, amateurs who just are willing to pay for, you know, a beer tab. Um, you know, there are some people who are really accomplished amateurs who just want to play so badly that they will, you know, they'll sort of agree to any terms that, that are given to them. And I, I think that the only, only way out of it would be a more united front, but, it's just it's so many people are into music and so many people want to share their passion that I just don't know if that's that's a realistic option. Um, you know, at the same time, I, I, I think it's, you know, if you, when you do these corporate gigs like they they're not afraid of of throwing money at it. Um, and, you know, the irony that was pointed out by my by my teacher in college, he said, you know, Josh the gigs that you enjoy the most are, will usually be the lower paying gigs and the gigs that you enjoy the least from a musical standpoint are, will usually be the higher paying gigs. And I, you know, I'll be damned if that's not absolutely what I've seen over the years. You know, I've had some great bar shows that, you know, paid a hundred bucks <laughs> and uh, you know, and they've been absolutely transcendently fabulous and i've had some corporate gigs where it's sit around and wait for six hours um to play for 30 seconds and yeah you're making a grand but you know you are just sort of sitting there and from a musical standpoint it's not satisfying at all and uh if there was a way to turn that on its head you know i don't know if there is or not um because these corporations have so much money to throw around but uh if there would be a way to turn that on its head it would be I think it would be world changing. Um, but I don't know if, again, I don't know if that's a realistic attitude either. And, you know, I'm also of two minds about this because I'm not digging ditches, you know, I mean, I'm not digging ditches and I'm not scrubbing toilets and I'm not picking up the garbage. Um, and I think those jobs are all severely underpaid. So, you know, I, I, I don't know. It's it's also trying to to strike that balance with a degree of gratitude as well, and I'm I'm sure you sort of felt that you know, uh, in your work, you know, yes I'm yes I'm I, you can be simultaneously um, underpaid and mistreated while also sort of retaining that sense of gratitude to be able to do what you do. It's it's a really interesting line to walk. So the only model I've been able to come up with. Uh, that would seem like some sort of long-term solution for this is pretty strange, but I'm going to try it out on you and you tell me what you think. Okay. I sort of see the necessity for the rise of a sort of monk class within music uh, that are dedicated to music as some kind of faith, uh, pilgrimage, like, music mystics or something like that that somehow are like maybe they're writing about music or they're they're just doing music for the sake of the the, the mystery and the meaning of music so that we can have some sort of injection into the culture and into our communities an injection of that level of reverence towards music 
so that we can seed the culture for the following generations so that they don't see music as, you know, something disposable, but something to revere. Now that's going to clash with the fact that music is infinitely accessible <laughs> uh, because of technology, but I just, I'm not sure I see another way out of this than some sort of profound spiritual change in the culture. I think that that's as good a model as anybody's pushed forward. Um, you know, something that we're having to deal with now in the internet era that we didn't have to deal with is that I think that culture could be downstream of art and music when you had less access to a lot of different uh, possibilities. So, you know, I, I don't think we're ever going to see another Beatles or another stones or anything like that because everything the media landscape is so fractured and the art landscape is so fractured like you can find your own niche and i don't know if they're going to be the bands that are going to attain that sort of or the artists that are going to attain that sort of visibility and that sort of influence are typically nowadays going to be um sort of appealing to the lowest common denominator of 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 taste and i know that sounds elitist and highfalutin but i'm just i'm just again it comes back to that overly produced sort of artificial uh pop thing um so that that would be my primary concern about that that model um i think that that is is a is a good possibility but i think that that's still going to be downstream from culture you know it's been said that politics is downstream from culture but i think that everything is the good news um is that i have i have had the sense that um a lot of people have woken up over the past couple of years in terms of how, you know, regardless of which side of the political spectrum you fall on, things are not right. You know what I mean? Like the system is, I think everybody that I talk to agrees that the system is broken and that our, our ways of interfacing with the world and, and our ways of living are, are kind of broken. And I, I think that it's not there yet because, you know, a lot of people came out of, you know, regardless of whether or not we are out of it, a lot of people came out of the 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 height of the pandemic and, and and flocked back to their old ways but i think a lot of people use that as a as a reset to start a new uh a new way of interfacing with reality and a new way of interfacing with uh the assumptions that they lived with and i think that there will be in the years to come continued fallout and continued momentum from that where people say no we we can change the way that we're living and I think that that might sort of reinforce um, reinforce some of the change that we're hoping to bring about in the music industry. I would also say that the gigs that I've had in the past, you know, 18 months or so, people have seemed more appreciative, generally speaking, than they have in the past. It's very common, especially when you're playing some of the kitschier styles like you know, New Orleans trad jazz or something like that to be brought in for these, what we like to call, you know, wallpaper gigs, right? <laughs> so like, you're just part of the set dressing, like nobody's listening to you. You're just part of the ambiance. And I have played fewer of those. And I don't think it's just a function of budget. I think people really want to, to appreciate it when they have music and the few sort of wallpaper gigs that I have played, uh, I've had more people come up and, and pay compliments uh, than I have in the past as well. So I think that there might be some degree of change in that regard happening already as a function of people sort of reassessing the assumptions that they had pre-2020. And maybe that's just me being, you know, sort of overly optimistic about it, but I don't know. I, I guess my question to you um, would be like, how how do you think musicians facilitating this cultural change within the music industry um how would you think that would gain momentum because you know artists are notoriously finicky and independent you know to get them to say oh we all need to do a change there's going to be a lot of people who you know say hell no <laughs> you do you i do me you know i don't know i don't know but let me say more about it <laughs> all right well i mean like i'm i'm on board i'm on board uh but yeah so yeah, say more. I think I think we can't. This might be a cop out answer, but I think we, in the model that I'm proposing, we're not there yet. I think it starts with having these sorts of conversations, 
uh, sowing these seeds of possibility in the minds of musicians and people who are related musical experts or or just people that appreciate music um, that there are doors that we can we could step through uh, that may open up uh, a greater world of music to us like the piper uh, the logo for the podcast is the piper he's playing a tune that leads you into a cave in the mountains but the story of the piper doesn't tell you what's in the mountains right so i think for now we're just we 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 just gotta admit that there's a lot of things about music that we don't understand or we've we've lost an understanding for there's more to it than meets the ear and i think we just start from there that's that's as good an answer as I think could be expected. Uh, and I think that I might add to that, holding your fellow musicians accountable for taking this stuff seriously. I mean, I'm not calling for a lack of levity, right? I mean, this is, I want to have a good time. And, you know, I'd rather play with someone who's an okay player, who's a great hang than someone who's a great player, who's an okay hang, right? <laughs> um, but uh, I think, you know, encouraging gratitude amongst your fellow bandmates and encouraging punctuality the things that the things that musicians are notoriously bad at right <laughs> you know punctuality professionalism <laughs> depending on your circles you know encouraging them to really take that sort of thing seriously and and again i, I will say that there is definitely a pre-2020 and post-2020 trend that i've noticed with the musicians that i'm working with there used to be guys i'm thinking of two guys in my band who would you know complain about every single gig and uh, they both came out of of that time period on the other side of it, and they're not complaining about gigs anymore. Something goes wrong, they, their response is, I'm just happy to be playing, I'm happy to be here, I'm happy to be here with everybody because, you know, I saw what it looks like when this doesn't exist, and it's not something that I could do. <laughs> so I think that that might be some some positive change coming from that as well. But I think that if you can get everybody on board with that same level of gratitude, that it might help facilitate some of the change that you're driving at too. If, if we are indeed in the driver's seat of this sort of uh, cultural shift in the way that we appreciate music, I think that might be one of the most important aspects. Yeah, we're, we're in the driver's seat. Everyone's in the driver's seat insofar as they're, they're responsible for whatever they're responsible for. So I think you're right. You know, it starts by, you know, having gratitude and an understanding that it is a responsibility to. And so if it's your responsibility, then, um, you know, take care of it. <laughs> right. So I want to shift gears in the intro. I will have kind of introduced people to your corpus a little bit so i'm sure you've done tons of research into fairies bigfoot things that go bump in the night that didn't go into your books there must be some stories about music in there yeah it's it's funny that you uh that you bring this up because i was just talking about this with somebody last night um it's something that i guess i'm going to have to start writing about at some point because it does wind its way through a lot of the stuff that I've looked at in a pretty noticeable way. Um, in my new book, which is the two part ecology of souls and new mythology of death and the paranormal, um, that sort of unnatural music is something that comes up time and time again. And, you know, the problem with approaching that in some sort of long form book is that, it's oftentimes indescribable. Like people go out of their way to describe it as being indescribable. You know, they'll say things like, Oh, it doesn't sound like it's any scale I've ever heard. You know, it doesn't uh, seem like it could be played by human hands, that sort of thing. So they're always really vague. And I guess it would be kind of be the similar problem that, uh, that one winds up with, with the smell book that I did, the brimstone deceit, you know, people don't often have the, proper way to articulate some of these things that they're experiencing especially if they're not musicians like i would i would love to hear a musician's description of some of this stuff but yeah you know you find that 
uh, during near-death experiences. It's described in that way. You know, the most indescribable music I've ever heard, more beautiful and grand than anything, but also so alien, not in that extraterrestrial sense, but in that sort of foreign, unknowable sense. You find that in some UFO cases, um, less so in the abduction era, although there are plenty of examples to be found, but it was more a hallmark of that, you know, 50s 60s contactee era where people claim to go to saturn and venus which you know i i tend to view as them going to some other reality rather than literally saturn or venus um but you'll find no adamski and i think it was uh oh i can't remember the other contactee that i mentioned in the book but they described you know again indescribable music beautiful grand couldn't be played by human beings um i think orfeo angelucci talked about that too so and then, you know, one of the most persistent aspects of, of fairy folklore, um, to the extent that sometimes that's like the full scope of the encounter, right? Like you'll find someone who was walking up Bin Bulb and, and they know that there's no one in sight along the uh, the face of this Irish mountain, you know, no one within miles. And they hear this fantastic music that they've never heard the likes of in their life. And then, you know, the music fades away and they're like, oh, it must have been the good folk. But I think there is some stuff to be mined there, you know, to a degree with uh, some of the melodies that supposedly came from the fey folk. Uh, you know, there are rumors that Danny Boy is a fey folk melody and there are plenty of others here and there. So, you know, a lot of people have written about, you know, the uh, you know connections between rock music and the occult or, you know, this or that or the other. Um, but I haven't seen, you know, anybody with a, a musicology background, which long story, I somehow wound up with one of those um, to get the performance degree, musicology degree, journalism degree. So I haven't seen anybody sort of take a musicological approach to some of these fairy melodies and seen if there's anything not inherently strange, but any sort of recurring uh recurring qualities to the to these melodies and see if you know oh look they use a lot of leaps of a fifth or something you know that's just a, it's a dumb example but you, you take my meaning that there might be some sort of trend that reveals itself after analyzing a lot of these melodies i think that would be a i think that would be a worthwhile project uh but i'm not sure how worthwhile the outcomes would be if that makes sense like i think you probably stand a 50 50 shot of finding something interesting from a supernatural perspective with with that sort of an approach, but yeah, it's definitely something that's cropped up time and time again across my research. Yeah. Actually that ties into the previous question we were discussing about trying to understand what's important about music as musicians, kind of having the humility to admit that we don't quite know, you know, just how much, uh, how, like, that, that we don't quite know the full purview of music. Um, so my question to you to try to illuminate that would be, is there any clues as to uh, why music uh, in their world or how they use music? What's the, what's the purpose? What's the meaning of them playing music what's how do they use it well i think that this probably comes down to one's own interpretation of the power of music like if you're really reductionist and think that it's just you know organized chaos that on a good day has the ability to elicit emotional reactions uh from you know just because of human physiology or something really you know sort of materialist and physicalist like that then you're you're not going to sort of say that there is anything to it but i mean i i think that that perspective of what music is is pretty narrow and, you know i looked up some uh you know but by that logic um minimalist compositions should not be able to elicit as much of a reaction because of their simplicity and because you know that that would be my take and yet some of the some minimalist music or some um music that sort of borders almost on Dadaist, um, like Eric Satie's uh, piano works, um, are for me some of the most emotional music that's out there. So I, I, I ascribe to the fact that there is something intangible about music, both in terms of its inherent power and its p power to connect, you know, people. And I don't just mean like people in the 
who are listening, but people who are playing it, I think that there is something to that that is really indeed transcendent and might even be, you know, dare I say, a, a gift from the other world. So to that extent, you know, you'll find music in some of these narratives um, leading people, especially in the fairy narratives, you'll find it leading people into the woods or, you know, sort of being used as a meth- mechanism of enticement. And, you know, if you look at sort of the, again, my, my Ballywick, the fairy stuff, um, you'll find uh, musicians being abducted with relative frequency, you know, being abducted to play a fairy party uh, for the evening. And they think that it's just one evening's party, but it ends up being, you know, 50 years or whatever when they emerge. Um, But I think it does speak to the fact that, you know, so there's this, there's this sort of uh, dichotomy that I've been wrestling with in terms of, uh, of how, you know, the fae folk are so closely associated with the dead. And yet, all the things that they tend to be reported doing um, are really celebrations of life. Like they're, you know, almost uh, pleasures of the flesh, right? You've got singing and you've got dancing and you've got feasting and you've got, uh, you know, amorousness (laughs) for lack of being more descriptive things that are really celebrating, you know, the act of living. And I I think that's an interesting uh, polarity that you see in that, in that specific phenomena, which you might be able to sort of graft onto the UFO phenomena as well. Well, um, sign me up for that book. Hopefully you do write it uh, and I can read it and we can talk about it. Uh, but, uh, you know, no pressure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'm, I, I decided to take a break for a little while after this one. Um, it, it, yeah, I don't know if you've had a chance to look at it, um, but it's 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 really long. And I'm not saying that as you know a virtuous thing. I think that brevity is the soul of wit. But I just I just couldn't get in and out without writing you know a book that's a third the length of the Bible. So I kind of feel sheepish about that. But um, it was this was sort of a snapshot. Ecology of Souls was sort of a snapshot of my current views on the phenomena and, and at least these phenomena and how I make it. Uh, quote unquote work uh, for me and how I think I think it fits together at this point in time and you know that was never the intention it was always just to look at sort of the the role that or the link that UFOs might have to death and to the dead and by extension just souls in general Um, but it just ended up being such a comprehensive look that I was like okay I'm gonna need to take some time off from writing another book that will likely be measured in years and not months because I just part of me you know, uh, part of me is just tired of writing <laughs> the monastic lifestyle of writing. Uh, I mean, it's, it's the main reason that, you know, I was always a very, uh, very dutiful practicer, you know, three or four days, three or four hours a day in a practice room, which is kind of like the max that you can max out as a brass player before just getting fatigued. Um, especially if you're playing in other, uh, contexts throughout the day. Um, but, you know, it's part of the reason that as I've gotten older that I'm not enjoying, you know, the time alone and the practicing is because, you know, you're alone. I think music is best made with others, right? So the monastic lifestyle of writing is something that I have, I, I, I sort of ebb and flow on my appreciation for it. And I'm definitely not appreciating it right now. Like I'm ready to come up from the basement and, and see human beings. So it's going to be a little while since I write books and I've got a couple ideas. The music one is something that like, is just going to haunt me until I actually write it. And we'll see where it goes. You know, there have been some books that have been written on paranormal sounds, which I haven't, I have not read, but I'm sort of like hesitant to do it because I'm not sure how, uh, <clears throat> how useful, uh, or I'm not sure how uh, how useful anything else that I would have to say if it would add to the conversation, but we'll see. You know, focusing in on music, dialing in on music might be a, a good thing to look into in the future, in a couple of years, probably. Usually we have a traditional closing question, um, but I want to change it. Uh, however, I would like to uh, kind of usher out the traditional closing question with you and then give you the new traditional closing question. <laughs> okay. I suppose is a contradiction in terms, but um, so the, this is the last time we'll do what should people listen to? 
wasn't that one of the jokes that was in Spinal Tap, the new originals? <laughs> I think that was a band name that, that was in Spinal Tap or one of these other <laughs> mockumentaries. The new, so this is the new original. What should people listen to? You know, different stuff. Like it's 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 so easy for me to, and this is going to be a rambling answer because I want to preface it a little bit, but it's so easy for me to, as you know, a tuba player, feel underrepresented. Um, but, you know, I look across the landscape of music and what's listened to, and it's always, you know, guitar bass keyboard drums if you know if you're feeling really indulgent you'll uh you'll break out a horn section and i'm not saying there's anything wrong with that i mean you know god knows i listen to plenty of bands that are that instrumentation but i always like you know i want to see like accordion players and you know bass clarinet players and bands and i want to see you know you know if, if a band's got a bazooki like i'm, I'm on board you know <laughs> so like i really wish that people would um you know, take a look at things like, I mean, it's a good example because it's considered so dorky, the accordion and be like, no, like this recognize, recognize when people have got game, you know, just because a band has an accordion, don't write it off. Um, So what should people be listening to? You know, my background, uh, probably the reason that I took to music was because my, my parents listening was, was pretty eclectic and crossed a, a wide variety of styles. Um, so are you looking for like genres or specific bands or is that question really open-ended it's i never interpret it for the for the guests okay I okay them play with the question fair enough um well so i guess my first answer if you're sort of looking for a broad answer would be just something that's a little bit weird so what i mean is you don't have to sit through something that you find uncomfortable to listen to because it's so strange and atonal but like if you do stumble across a band where you're like, oh, they've got a they've got a so and so player, that's odd. Like, give them a little bit more attention. You know, if, if they just so happen to have a tuba player, all the better. Um, you know, as far as specific artists that I don't think uh, get as much attention as they should, or maybe deserve to have some light shed on them, there's a band that I was introduced to a while back by a friend of mine Uh, we had sort of a listening party where we got together and shared each other's music and this is man i say a little while back over 10 years now (laughs) um and he introduced me to a band that he described as the best rock band that you've never heard um and uh it's this this uh band called firewater and i they have a lot of um his early output is like aping tom waits and it took him a while to find his his footing um but he once he sort of moved i believe to i believe this is the story he moved to island southeast asia and he sort of started incorporating a lot of those elements and it's just it's for me it's a it's a very fresh sound there are a lot of comparable bands that are out there you know he's played with eastern european sounds as well um but i i find everything top to bottom to be really really fantastic about that band it's not the most virtuosic playing in the world but it's just different you know and there's a lot of uh unique percussion um his horn his horn section consists entirely almost entirely of just a trombone player in fact i think he toured with just two trombones (laughs) you know is his basic band and two, two trombones but you know we're talking tabla we're talking you know all sorts of other percussion as well and uh firewater i think is a band that that deserves some love um I don't, there, there hasn't been a lot of, uh, I think it's been, man, it must have been about six or so years, uh, maybe even seven years since their last album. Uh, but it's, it's, it's a band that I think is really fun to listen to. And I keep coming back to it. You know, that's the thing you listen to interesting stuff, but what is it that's interesting that you were introduced to that you keep coming back to? And I've had friends introduce me to bands that have been like, this is great. And I'll go through a period where I listen to it and I never listen to it again, but I keep coming back to this band that I was introduced to firewater. You know what? I, I love listening. People play with that question so much. I, I can't, I can't let go. I'm going to keep it. Well, it's, it's a good question. And I kind of like having a traditional question at the beginning or end of the podcast, because it sort of gives you a baseline for where people are coming from. And you can see, You know, it tells you as much about someone's thought process as it does about their actual answer and their tastes, you know. Thanks a lot for coming on the podcast. I really appreciate it. It was was great. Uh, Is there anything that uh, 
maybe I forgot or you would have liked to talk about or I mean I so rarely get to talk about music on podcasts in this depth or, or from this perspective that uh that you know we could probably talk all day um I will say that so like I, I'm gonna I'm gonna say this and people are gonna think that I'm hating on video games or whatnot like I I love playing video games I wish I could play more video games it's just a faction of a factor of time but you know I see a lot of young people as I did you know really invested in these things and treating them like hobbies and I would just encourage um anyone but especially young people to take up an instrument because there are few things more satisfying than being hyper competent to really good at something. Right. And I think that the, the level of reward that you get from being skillful at a musical instrument is orders of magnitude greater than you do from being good at Fortnite or whatever, you know? And I think that if you really want to experience, you know, a, a almost mystical interaction mystical experience a transcendent experience if you do get to a certain level with playing music and you're playing with people of that similar level you, you find your way there you know you can do it through meditation you can probably do it through entheogens um but if you want to if you want to earn it like obviously meditation is earning it but if you want to earn it in a, a little bit more uh, communal way uh, playing music with folks is something that i think can do that same thing you know when you play with the same group of folks enough times that you could just give them a look and they know, and you both know what you're thinking and you just completely change the style on a dime. That's something that's absolutely magical. And I don't think is entirely explained by, Oh, I know what they like to do. And we, we play music together a lot like this. There's something really, I would say uh, low level telepathic about what's going on there. And then, you know, this other thing is, you know, once you, learn your instrument well enough to improvise or you know if you're a, if you're a bass player and you're sort of just reading changes and you're putting in fills and you're just sort of playing you're not you're not doing the same thing every time you, you there's something else that sort of comes into you and sort of takes over for a moment and you know you can listen back to yourself and be like I, I did that you know it's it really is um it breaks down that uh that mind or conscious mind body barrier in a way that I think allows for other positive things uh, to come in. And I'm sure negative things too, but you take my meaning. Um, and I just would encourage folks, you know, if just, just, just try um, playing an instrument and, you know, the, 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 the better you get, the more fun it is really, it, it really is. So that would be my sort of parting shot, I guess. Now let's continue our broadcast with music. You were thrown into a tin can And you learned how to beg and borrow And you grew into a thin man In a land of success, sin and sorrow now you're sleeping in a suitcase With a pill bottle for a pillow When you're hanging by a shoelace It can get to be hard to swallow When you're spinning on the subway Naked lights dancing on the river No, you're never gonna leave her Though you think someday that you might forgive her Slipping into a slow dive Cold black water makes you follow Swimming into a spiral Still you're singing Shine Confusion. 
When you're lying in the soft arms of a silent ambulance that's speeding And you're trying to tell the doctor that it's only a broken heart You don't have to be a soldier to fight, but you better have a killer in ya You don't have to be a poet to die, it's the little things that kill ya Everybody gets a bad break, a little hit of pain and sorrow Just forget about tomorrow, keep on 